great pleasure to be back here after 10 years and it was a great honor for me to inaugurate this center. I will not forget the discussion between Professor Bala and myself in regard to the name of the center. The most important part of the name in fact, is the smallest word there, the conjunctive and, because it involves citizenship, corporate citizenship. When you say corporate governance and citizenship, the citizenship sort of gets lost. <coughs> but it's corporate governance and citizenship. So the center is involved in corporate citizenship. And um, that name was decided because by 2002 in my corporate governance journey, which uh, started back many years, I'm a corporate lawyer by profession, I went on the bench and uh, resigned as a judge for many reasons. Uh, you can imagine in South Africa some of those reasons. Um, but once a judge, always a judge, and you do not go back into practice. That's the system adopted in South Africa and the rest of the Commonwealth countries following the English system. And um, I, many of my clients asked me to become a non-executive director of their companies, and which I did, and I then became chief executive, and I chaired companies in Europe I sat on boards in America and in Southern Africa. So I saw governance both from an academic and a practical side. I've been on both sides of the coin. During the very sad days of apartheid and after I'd resigned as a judge, I chaired an organization called Operation Hunger in which we fed two and a half million children every day for 17 years. And Mr. Mandela's one daughter worked for me. So while he was in jail, he and I indirectly kept into communication. I knew him before he went into jail. And when he came out of jail, um, he invited me and some others for lunch. Uh, but in 1992, I was chairman of two very large organizations. One was the largest textile industry company in the Southern Hemisphere. And I don't have to tell all of you present the enormous difficulties in the textile industry at that time. And I was also chairman of the largest corporate and merchant bank, First National. Uh, so my hands were rather full. But I was approached by the Institute of Directors, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and various other bodies because of probably my background as a corporate lawyer and having done uh, being a director. Asked me whether I would chair a committee to write guidelines for the majority of our fellow citizens who have not been in the mainstream of our economy. How to direct and how to manage. I was considering this because of my hands being full when I got a call from the great man himself, Mr. Mandela. How's my favorite judge? <laughs> then I knew I had to do a lot of work without remuneration. <laughs> anyway, it was during that conversation um, when he asked me advice about something else that I told him about this approach for my heading this committee. And he said, you're the right man for the job. <laughs> and um, well, you don't say no to a great statesman like the late Mr. Mandela, 
and um, I agreed to do it and I formed the committee and you can all look at the King One report as it became known, issued in 1994. Um, my committee reflected the rainbow nation which we became. And I had one, I had a couple of criteria. The one was hand on heart, you drew this for the interests of South Africa Inc. without remuneration. The second one was that I wanted a blank slate. I did not want a remit. Because all of you will remember the corporate collapses and scandals in the United Kingdom which led to the appointment of Adrian Cadbury, now Sir Adrian Cadbury, to write guidelines for directors and managers on, quote, the financial aspects of governance. You will see that narrow focus. And I was determined not to be committed by remit with that kind of focus. And so with that clean slate, we sat down and uh, I wrote every word of King One. By the time King Two came around, I learned to appoint subcommittees and uh, have other people to help. It was an enormous task. And it was because of the very special circumstances, I believe, in South Africa, that we came up with what became known around the world as the inclusive approach to governance. That a company is not an island surrounded by a moat of shareholders. It is not this artificial person, incapacitated and inanimate, that has no capacity at all until you are appointed its directors and become the heart, mind and soul of the company. It is an entity which becomes the link for many stakeholders, many interest groups and its activities, the way it conducts business, impacts on all those stakeholders and humanity society and on the environment and of course financially and so we said that you should take account of the legitimate and reasonable needs interests and expectations of the stakeholders relevant to the business of the company in your decision making process guided always by the best interests of the company for the maximization of the total value of the company. Notice I didn't say book value and I did not say economic value. Because we recognized way back in 1994 that good <laughs> corporate citizenship was as important as a good bottom line. Because without being a decent corporate citizen, in fact, your business would not be sustainable. And evidentially that was established, certainly by 1997, when an analysis of the great stock exchanges on the great, the great companies on the great stock exchanges of the world showed that 80% of the market cap of those companies were not represented by additives in a balance sheet according to financial reporting standards, be they international financial reporting standards of this part of the world or the financial accounting standard board standards US GAAP in the United States of America, the great capital market with standards different from the rest of the world. The New York Stock Exchange exhibited that, the London Stock Exchange, Johannesburg, the National Stock Exchange here as well. What is it that made up that 80% that wasn't reflected as physical and financial assets? Well, the 
it was made up of an assessment of the integrity of the board, the reputation of the company. What was the ability of the business of the company to sustain itself long term? That a trustee of your pension fund could discharge his or her duty of care to you to make a decision to invest in the equity of that company. That the probability was it would sustain value creation in the longer term. The way we report will determine the way we behave. I think we can't forgive the our directors of the 19th century when the concept of limited liability really took hold. When they looked around the world, they saw a world of almost infinite nat natural assets, limitless. We know today that natural assets are finite and diminishing. We also know that the earth does not have an infinite capacity to absorb waste. So those directors of the 19th century into the 20th century, certainly till the middle of the 20th century, maybe we can forgive them even. But certainly those directors of the 19th century and the turn into the 20th century could not, as a matter of reasonableness, foreseen the population explosion of the 20th century because of the advance of medical science and the demand for product and for services. And the corporate sin of greed I'm afraid, took over. And produce at any cost. Never mind the impact on society or the environment. The share price, the bottom line, was the critical issue. And today we are suffering the consequences of that exclusive approach to governments. Milton Friedman, one of the great minds of the late, the quarter of the 20th century, said that the corporation has nothing to do with social responsibility. Its sole purpose is to make profit without deception or fraud. I might be doing that great laureate an injustice, but I believe tacitly what he was saying is that the company is apart from society and not a part of society. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is as much a citizen of India as you who are born here in India. And evidence of that abounds. When there's a corporate failure, it impacts on thousands of people. Financial reporting is critical, but alone it is not sufficient. Sustainability reporting is critical, but alone is not sufficient. If you have a financial report in a silo, and you have a global reporting initiative report in a silo, alone they are not sufficient. Not only that, you have a report in international financial reporting standard language, and you have a report in sustainability reporting language, which a majority of the average reader does not understand. To be accountable, we have to be understandable. We direct our companies in a very changed world of the 21st century. Global financial crisis, climate change, population explosion, 
radical transparency with social media, ecological overshoot, <coughs> where we continue to use the natural assets of planet Earth faster than nature's regenerating them. And in 30 to 50 years' time, maximum, we will have another 2 billion on people on planet Earth, from 7 billion to 9 billion, demanding product, and yet a diminishing natural asset base. And if business persons believe they can carry on as usual in that context, welcome to the age of stupidity. <laughs> that is why some of the great business leaders of today, 103 of the world's great iconic companies became pilot programmers of the International Integrated Reporting Council. Let me tell you about that. That was formed towards the end of 2010 at St. James's Palace in London with the convening power of Prince Charles. Uh, I went there in my then capacity as chairman of the Global Reporting Initiative. There was the chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board, the chairman of the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, the Chairman of the Institute of Internal Auditors, the President of the World Bank, the President of the Financial Accounting Standards Board of America, <coughs> the President of the International Federation of Accountants and the Chief Executive of IFAC, uh, the World Business Council of Sustainable Development, the United Nations Environmental Programme, Secretary General. You will see disparate bodies. But I was privileged, as were others who were present, to witness corporate history because we agreed at that meeting. And here was the Financial Accounting Standards Board and the International Accounting Standards <coughs> Board, who for 14 years had been discussing the convergence of financial reporting standards and could not, and have still not agreed them, agreeing that the way we had reported for 80 years was no longer fit for purpose. We needed a form of reporting that tried to describe the 80% of value that we were not telling our stakeholders about. And so the International Integrated Reporting Council was formed, of which today I am the chairman. What is integrated thinking? It is an acceptance that a company uses resources. When we started the directors of the 19th century using the company as the medium through which to conduct business, human capital, intellectual capital used natural assets, society purchased those products. And so financial and manufactured capital was created. And yet for 80 years we just reported on the financial and manufactured capital. We forgot about all the other capital and resources. Integrated thinking also acknowledges that there should be an ongoing relationship with the stakeholders linked to a company. Learning about their legitimate and reasonable needs, interests and expectations, accepting the interdependence and interconnection <coughs> between those relationships and the resources used by the company that the company has these activities and also has an output, which is its product, but the product itself has an impact. The Coca-Cola company, that great company, realized some years ago that water was the scarcest commodity on planet Earth. Without water, they couldn't make Coca-Cola. And so started their long-term strategic plan of reduce, reuse, replenish, and recycle water. And because of civil society alleging that the Coca-Cola company, McDonald's and others, were the cause of the obesity of children in America, the Coca-Cola company had to think again strategically. And so many of you would have noticed from the 12th of May 2013 a change in the marketing that they will not advertise to children under the age of 12. They will have exercise yards 
wherever they have bottling plants, they will have on their containers nutritional labeling and they will try and make their product with a lower calorie count as possible. After the collapse of Tyco, WorldCom and Enron, the IASB and the FASB believed that they should improve the standard of financial reporting. And so complexity was added to complexity. And what was incomprehensible before became even more incomprehensible. And to the average user, it was absolutely incomprehensible. And yet, it is all of you who were providing the capital to the great companies of the world. Because a beneficial download shows, download shows that the provider of capital today is not the wealthy family. It's pension funds, superannuation funds, etc. Your money. <coughs> so a company has to operate within the limits of an earth, the Earth's resources. It is good, hard-nosed business to accept that. It is good, hard-nosed business to accept that you should operate as a good corporate citizen. And the 103 iconic companies who joined our pilot programming have done integrated thinking, doing integrated reports. The 450 companies in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange who for the last three years have done integrated reports have found many benefits from this integrated thinking. Putting their annual financial statement online, their GRI report, sustainability report online, but the board applying its collective mind to these issues, understanding them, and taking the material issues out of those complicated, incomprehensible reports to the average user, and explaining it in clear, concise, and understandable language so that the trustees of your pension fund can make an informed assessment that the business of this company will continue to create value in the longer term. So, the 50 asset owners, the great asset owners and asset managers of the world, the Japanese pension fund, the Norwegian pension fund, Hermes, Prudential, have joined the asset network of the IRC. The Chartered Institute of Management Accountants has joined. They've all signed memoranda of understanding. Are they all wrong? Are great companies like Unilever, whose chief executive Paul Pullman said some four years ago, if we carry on as usual, I think my company will survive for another seven years. And so he changed direction completely. To make products, re-engineer his products so you and I use 50% less water and 50% less energy in making it. To return zero waste to landfill. To put all his products in recycled material. <coughs> to change the factories driven by the main grid to renewable energy. And he's found the cost of production coming down in certain places and huge advantages from it. Is he wrong? Is Unilever wrong? Is Microsoft wrong? Is HSBC wrong? These are some of the companies that are doing this. These are the world corporate leaders of the world. Winston Churchill, towards the end of the war, wrote a three-page letter to his wife. At the end of it, he said, if I'd had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. <laughs> <laughs> now, what a board has to do is spend more time understanding the financial report. I can tell you, having chaired companies, some directors do not understand the financial report. A survey done in London showed that up to 70% of directors never even read the sustainability report. Never mind understanding it. We have a duty as directors to understand these reports. Translate them from this complicated language 
into clear, concise and understandable language so that our stakeholders, our end users, our providers of capital, our customers, this is the lifeblood of our business, can make an informed assessment that the business of this company will sustain value creation long term. We have to, into our long-term strategy, embed the sustainability issue material to our business as water is to the beverage manufacturer. We are, at the moment, because of the crisis that the planet is in, we are steering our companies down the street of lost opportunity. We have to turn them around the corner into the avenue of sustainable capitalism. And sustainable capitalism means an inclusive approach to make sure that we embrace the impact of how we make money and our product on society, the environment, and of course financially. It's good, hard-nosed business sense to do so. Helen Keller, that famous blind woman, once said, there's something worse than being blind. That's having sight and no vision. What is it that all of you see around you in directing your companies? Well, you see a very changed world. You see a world of diminishing resources and yet an increased demand for product. You see that your business model, how you make your money, is impacting on society and the environment, your product or your service itself. How are you directing your company in that regard? Whether it's the best of times or it's the worst of times, it is the only time that we've got. And it is at this time that we have to embrace these difficulties and these challenges and change our mindsets that we've had on this exclusive approach to governance and have an inclusive approach. Doing business in the 21st century is not the same as in the past. We must not let the net generation say of us, as it is said in prayer, that we left undone things that we should have done and we did things we should not have done. Thank you very much for listening. Questions? Virtually or really? No question. Well, an inclusive approach to governance is that you uh, acknowledge the resources being used by your company. And most companies use uh, financial assets, manufactured assets, human capital, natural assets, intellectual capital, social capital, the relationship with your stakeholders. So you should learn about what are the le legitimate and reasonable needs, interests and expectations of your stakeholders. Look at the resources being used and those relationships with your stakeholders. Are you meeting those expectations? When management is informed about that, management can develop strategy on a more informed basis. Management can put a more informed strategy to the board. The board at every board meeting should have an agenda item, stakeholder relationships, at which some of the great companies in the world have appointed corporate stakeholder relationship officers. His or her sole job is to talk to stakeholders, external and internal, inform management of what their needs, interests and expectations and perceptions are. This report goes to the board, so the board four or six times a year whenever it meets is informed right through the 12-month reporting cycle about this and is almost seamlessly in a position to do an integrated report at the end of the 12-month cycle. 
this is an inclusive approach to governance. And it embraces the impact, how the company makes its money, that's the business model, on financially, society and the environment, incorporates all that into its strategic thinking, as I've tried to describe to you, Coca-Cola does, so that when we talk about corporate social investment, if you include all that in your strategic thinking, you're actually achieving a socially responsible outcome. So strategically, companies need to think on that basis, but you need that inclusive approach. The exclusive approach which we adopted and which I was nurtured, to look only at the interests of the shareholder when I was a student, I was taught about the interests of the general body of shareholders. Have you ever thought of that phrase? Have you ever tried to define the general body of shareholders? We know they're preferred shareholders. They are ordinary shareholders. They're deferred shareholders. Who's this general body? Is it someone you extract out of the total issued capital? And yet, that's how we were brought up. And we looked at only the interests of the shareholder. And this arose from the fact that in the 19th century into the 20th century, the capital was provided by wealthy families. And wealthy families had their members as directors. So stakeholders, especially employees, referred to them as the owners. Shareholders are not owners. The company is a person. You are a person. If I said to you, I own you, you would laugh at me. Slavery was abolished hundreds of years ago. The company is a person. It has its own identity. It has its own assets, its own liabilities. It's sovereign. Nobody owns it. The shareholders have a conglomeration of incorporeal rights. They have the right to appoint the board. They have the right to receive payment of a dividend, provided it's not out of capital, and provided the board has declared the dividend. They can remove the board if they don't like what the board is doing. So they have rights, but they don't own the company. The company sits there sovereign. And you need to direct that company, as I said, it's an incapacitated entity, inanimate, until you are appointed as director. You become the heart, mind, and soul of the company. And that starts giving, when you think about it on that basis, that gives you content to the duties of good faith, care, skill, and diligence.